And uh, I guess, would you say that, well, at least uh, one of your first big breaks came along in 74 when you signed with ABC Records? Well, I didn't see it like that. I mean, yeah, it was a big contract for me, but it didn't last long. Now, that's when I had a, a breakfast with Jimmy Buffett one morning, and he was complaining about he wasn't going anywhere, and that was about a month before Margaritaville hit. But you needed a Margaritaville to make it sure. uh, out of a company like uh, ABC Records because they really, uh, you know, they had all the A&R men and all the promotions in the world. But I don't, I don't know. I'm, I mean, it certainly wasn't country. And I don't know why I never clicked with the country establishment in Nashville, but, of course, all of my heroes didn't either. I mean, beginning with Hank Williams. They you know, uh, I mean, basically threw him out of the Opry there towards the yeah. end. Yeah, the, when Hank came down, you know that story for his last ride. And the word came out to the Grand Ole Opry that Hank Hank's out there in his Cadillac mm-hmm. in bad shape. The only one who went down to talk to Hank was Bill Monroe. Everybody else said, don't bring him up here. Yeah. I... Keep him away. And then truth is, Hank was trouble at that point. Mm-hmm. But he he was still making the hits, though. Yeah. He certainly was. And, um, you know, it's been said, I talked to Jerry Bird, uh, who was his uh, steel guitar player. In fact, more than that, he was really uh, one of the drifting uh, cowboys, one of the one of the guys that uh, uh, kind of taught Hank a lot. Uh, but he said that, uh, you know, Hank was kind of the Daryl Strawberry of country music. I mean, he was not very pleasant to fans and not very, he didn't, he yeah. didn't take it as any kind of, like Willie Nelson will sign autographs for hours for anybody, any comers, you know, he, he's there. Um, but uh, not Hank. Hank would often, uh, you know, he would go off on the fans sometimes. He didn't think he owed him anything. Yeah. And I guess that's maybe probably part of the legend. If he he didn't live such a tragic life, would he really have had such an impact on, well, as much impact as he did? Because most of his songs came out of his, uh, I guess, his tragic life, his uh, situation that he was in with him and Audrey. and Yeah. Well, his stuff is beautiful and ranks right at the top of, along with uh, King of the Road and Me and Bobby McGee, you know, some of the greatest songs written in country music. You could pick just about any of Hank's, and they'd be right up there. And, and of course, his, the way he lived it, you know, he he lived it. There's no, you know, it's kind of trite, but it's true. And that's why the people that are able, like Van Gogh as an artist, his life and his art were interwoven totally. He wasn't like Garth Brooks. Sure. You know, Garth Brooks or Alice Cooper or somebody, you know, they would perform and then they would go play golf with the record executives or, or whatever. I mean, their the normal life was very different, very under control. So there's something to be said for somebody whose life is spinning out of control. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, some of the sparks inspire the rest of us. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess, Kinky, would you say that your music was uh, mostly categorized as uh, outlaw music? Is that what you would say, outlaw country? Well, I think Soul American was one of the, uh, was early on that and Billy Joe Shaver. Uh, the two of us were kind of the... Uh, spiritual snowplow of the country music, and the ones that reaped it all in were Willie and Waylon, who, of course, were not the best of friends. No. But uh, but then, uh, I, I don't know, I never thought it, I guess it fitted in with the outlaw thing a bit, but uh, I kind of go back to Woody Guthrie. I, I like to fight fight respectability every chance I get. Yeah. And the outlaw movement certainly did that. And, uh, and and paid a price for it, by the way. True. And and you know, I was trying to decide, Paul. Somebody once asked me whether whether it was an influence, whether you know, because you, to listen to country music today, you'd never know there ever was any outlaw music. Yeah. So well, the pendulum has swung all the way back now. Yeah. And uh, you know, you got these kind of guys that all look alike, or. They sell 99 zillion albums off the bat, and then a record company drops them, and they don't sell anything, right? Yeah. They're 23 years old, and they're already burned out, and it's over. And that's kind of the way the the business works. 
And so, uh, you certainly don't have, uh, well, maybe with the exception of Vince Gill, there are very few lasting stars uh, like Ernest Tubb and Roy Acuff and uh, some of the giants are, of what country music used to be. That's right. And and uh, many of them lasted a long time. And, uh, but, and it just, uh, you know, it was inevitable that it was going to happen that, uh, you know, I heard a good song the other day by Alan Jackson. And, uh, well, this wasn't the other day. It was a couple of years ago. I heard it, I said, my God, that's a good song by somebody, you know? Yeah, hey, occasionally. And, and then, then the announcer said, and that's the old Roger Miller song. And, of course, it was just a cover of Roger Miller that I'd, I'd forgotten about. Uh, that song, uh, you know, the one the light bulb is burning at the end of the hall. Uh, who says, uh, no, I don't know, who says you can't have it all, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Great song and uh, yeah, but everything Roger Miller wrote was great. Even the uh, the, the little parody or spoof songs were were brilliant. Dang I mean, me, dang yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't find a bad Roger Miller song. And uh, speaking of some of the Opry giants, you've performed at the Grand Ole Opry several times over your career. Huh? And uh, do you remember who introduced you the first time you ever went out on stage there? The first time I think we took. Um, we took uh, Doby Gray with us, who I, I think was one of the first black people to ever sing on the Opry. Uh, um, and uh, Billy Swan was with us. And we were introduced by uh, the Reverend Jimmy Snow. Okay, Hank Snow's uh, son. Hank, Hank's son. And he introduced me as the first full-blooded Jew to ever appear in the Grand Ole Opry. And, uh, and Tom Paul Glazer introduced us once, uh, who was very, uh, we, we worked with Tom Paul all the time. But um, it was interesting because I think uh, D. Ford Bailey, of course, the, what the, uh, he was black. And I think Bill Monroe was also the only one who went to his funeral. So old Bill Monroe well, was a very progressive guy. Yeah. And a very important guy. And I, I only met Bill a few times. But I, I think those early guys were, uh, were very cool characters and, uh, and uh, great musicians. And uh, and I don't really see that kind of spirit today. Maybe you know, maybe it's just that uh, you know, maybe there's different generations that listen to different stuff. But you know, Texas has a whole bunch of bunch of musicians coming up too, and all these musicians today seem to have the same thing going, which is they're just not very clever, right? I mean, they're just not. Yeah. And there's no great songs. You can't listen to that and say, "Man, that was," you know, you 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 don't. There's no great writing. There might be a good line in it, but uh, that's about it. And, and then you go back to to that era, and, and there were a bunch of self-pitying kind of soppy songs written. That is true, but there was also some great stuff. But uh, I'll agree with you that I think the last time I heard a great song on the radio was when Alan Jackson uh, re-recorded uh, Jim Ed Brown's Papa Top. I, I don't uh, know how many years ago that was. Maybe that was from the same album that the Roger Miller one was on that you were talking about? Well, pretty soon you can do them all. You can do uh, Country Bumpkin, you can do whatever there is, re-record them, and, and they'll fly with the young people who uh, don't have an emotional history about that era. They don't, I mean, I, I can't imagine that people are going to be talking about uh, the recording artists of today uh, far, very far into the future, because the whole culture has, uh, what, ADHD or whatever it is. We yeah. forget fast and we move fast, and and uh, you know where you can really hear great country music and you can find people that know what you and I are talking about, Paul? Where? Is in England, in Ireland, in Scotland, in New Zealand, and Australia. Yeah, we had, uh, I, well, I had on Stonewall Jackson on last week and he had just gotten back from a two-week tour over in Ireland. He played every night of the week out there. They just uh, love country music. In yeah, Europe. but they're also, um, uh, it's not that they just love country music, they know the good stuff. I mean, they know what's good. Australia, particularly, 